All right, got him relaxed. We got it ready, and we got Beauty and the Beast. Hello and welcome. This is lecture three of Beauty and the Beast, and I'm Nick Lugo, and let's do it. Let's get into it. We're gonna get into Bell today, so this is gonna be this is gonna be fun. This is gonna be fun. If you haven't seen lecture one, it's gonna be up there, and um, if you're listening, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. But right now we're going to get into Belle and we're essentially just going to figure out what she represents and who she is and why you were suddenly drawn to this movie because that's, you know, there's something interesting in that. So the first thing that we're introduced is literally the song Belle and, you know, the, the entire idea of the song is there must be more than this provincial life and it's a strong idea. It's a strong idea and this is, this is an idea that permeates itself amongst many movies. There's actually the movie Aladdin with Princess Jasmine. It's almost the same thing. But I think Beauty and the Beast goes into it a little bit more. I think you get to understand Belle a little bit more throughout this throughout this idea. In, in this movie, she's the main character. In Aladdin, you have Aladdin as the main character, obviously. So we're going to go through. And the thing is, so she wakes up and, you know... The first thing that we could get from her, and I think this is why they chose Emma Watson as the as the live action character, is because she's just the very bright eyed person, right? Like you look at her in this case, and she's just you know, inventive, imaginative, and and bright. You know, like that's 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 really what Belle is supposed to represent. You know, right now all she is is she's an idealist. That's that's the thing that we get from the first song, and I'll, I'll really take you through it. So. You have essentially this entire, right? So Belle, the song Belle is all about the city that she lives in and the, the, the poor provincial town. And, um, and the, the funny thing is, it, everything in this movie or everything in this town revolves around a clock. It revolves around this bell tower that, well, once it strikes 8 a.m., everybody gets up. You know, everybody, everybody, um, well... Yeah, everybody wakes up, you know, and everybody, what do they do? They say bonjour. So I'll take you through the shallow representation, and then I'll take you through exactly what it means. So they say bonjour, and um, and they're very judgmental, right? They're very judgmental. They're always looking at her. There's the people who cheat on their wives, and there's it's essentially a kingdom of sheep, and... Um, and you have the judgmental, you have the judgmental women, you have the judgmental school children, and um, and Belle's just not having it. You know, it's 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 a very in the way that she views it, she views it as a quote little town full of little people. And let's let's really break down what that means. You know, it's she doesn't mean the the people are short. You know, like she she means that the people are small minded, they're little minded. You know, and. Really, they're just like the beast, right? If you really think about it, all they are is people who are focused on the surface level, people who only care about the things that are right in front of them. They don't care about anything deeper, anything more spiritual, anything more than just what is given to them. And well, obviously, that is why we have Bella as the bright-eyed character. We have Bella as the person who is Essentially, she's the yin within the yang, you know, she's the chaos within the order because you have this entire idea of, you know, everybody revolved around a clock and everybody who only cares about, you know, what is going to happen to me today and how much money am I going to make today as opposed to will I be happy today? And, you know, all the, all the questions that Belle is going to pursue within this movie and, you know, how can I fulfill my deepest desires? She's the yin. She, she's the tiny little the tiny little black dot within within the order so within the within the white space so and that's exactly what this means right so when everybody comes in and they say bonjour right it's interesting because you'd think of that as a good thing right everybody comes up and they say hi to each other the only problem here and this is how it's depicted in the movie is that people only say bonjour to each other right it's almost like you know when when i go up to you and i say hello to you and let's say we're strangers I'm going to say hi, you're going to say hi, I'm going to say how are you doing, you're going to say good, and 
then we just end up with some surface level conversation, you know, and that's exactly what they're depicting here. Everybody says bonjour, everybody says hello, but even if you're going through the most traumatic of suffering, even if, let's say you're, I don't know, you're depressed, you're feeling really sad, you're going to put on a smile for me. And that's the social convention that we use. And the question is why? The question is why? It's because we want to keep this shallow interaction. I don't want to let you in on my life and you don't want to let me in on your life. And well, the question is why? And that's that's an idea that, that we're going to explore a little bit deeper. But to give you the basic answer, it's because it maintains social cohesion, right? It, I, I don't want to let you in too deep. I just want you to maintain this sort of, you know, this small friendship that we have where I could count you as an ally and you could count me as an ally and then we could function as a society. That's really it. You're not, well, that's a good connection between the last lecture and this is exactly what we're going to be going into. You know, you're not a person to me as a stranger. You're just a tool. You're just a tool for social cohesion. And the thing that really solidifies this is this picture right here. This is from the original movie and um, the animated movie. And it's a man who's standing here in something like shackles. I, I forget what these things are called, but you know, he's a prisoner, right? He's a prisoner and, um, and he's going through this public shaming, right? The, the, it's almost like a guillotine. I forget exactly what it's called, but all he's doing is sitting there and he's going through a public shaming. You know, this is where they say you're a criminal and um, you're a criminal and everyone in the public is going to know that you're a criminal. So essentially, he's going through an in inexplainable amount of suffering. But what does he do? He still says bonjour. He still says hello. He tips his cat to the lady and says bonjour. And you ask the question, why? Like, what does this mean? And that's really the reality of it that I just explained. No matter what pain you're going through, no matter what suffering you're going through, you're going to want to stick with the surface level. You're going to want to stand with it. And, well, that's what she means by little town full of little people. Now we'll keep going. And we have the, we have the barber here who says her head's up on some cloud, right? He's judging her and he's, um, and he's making a mistake, right? You can see right here, he's cutting off the person's entire mustache. And that's, that's, the, that's the other idea, right? We're so judgmental that we'll say bonjour to each other. We'll say hello, but behind everybody's back, we're going to keep this sort of um, judgmental nature. So in some sense, we're not even a community. In some sense, we are separate from each other, right? I'll say hello to your face and then I'll judge you behind your back. And um, and then there's, there's this idea that, that's brought in here that, it, that it's to your detriment, right? That it's to your detriment of, you know, obviously to the fact that he's, uh, he's making a mistake as a barber. So right here, I want to stop and, and explain the psychological idea behind this and, and what exactly Bell is, Bell is going against, you know? So Bell is someone that we could consider one of, one of her characteristics here is she's authentic, right? She's authentic. She's true to herself. And, um, and she hasn't been influenced by the culture yet. This is, this is where we get to the actual life lessons. You know, we have someone like Bell who like every single child, is their own person. You know, you think about you think about a child and a child is someone who is completely acting on their own impulses, right? If they want to go get food, they're going to go get food. If they want to scream in in public, they're going to go scream in public. Unlike somebody who's well socialized, well socialized, I'll say in quotes, is who who's going to repress it and hold it in just like just like the man in the shackles here. And um and the thing about Belle is she's completely authentic and she finds herself now alienated by her culture. You know, her culture says one thing and she says another and, well, now they're going to be at clash. You know, if we're talking about the personalities here, right, and this is this, um, this connects to the last lecture, you know, she's the personality of the child hero, right? She's the personality of the imaginative dreamer who is truly an individual, who is truly herself. 
But now she's going to be faced with a, we'll say, demon, right? She's going to be faced with a villain. And the villain in this case is going to be culture, right? She's faced with this villain of culture that is spiritually poor, surface level, and shallow, right? And, um, and currently she sees herself sitting outside the system. Currently she sees herself as somebody who's, well, if we're going to go with the Disney example, right? You know, the Disney idea, someone who wishes upon a star, but her culture is telling her to stay on the ground. And this is an idea that she's going to be struggling with throughout the entire time. So, um, so yes, here's the di here's the initial diagnosis of, we'll say, modern day society, right? Here's the diagnosis of her world, the world in which she has been brought in but doesn't want to exist in. It's a surface level world that only cares about using each other for tools, right? But when you have the chance, you can judge somebody behind their back because, well, you can, because you can, because you don't care about them as a human, right? That's another idea, right? You still see them as a tool. You only see them as someone that you could use maybe for judgment case, you could say to feel good about yourself or to potentially um, bond with other people because they're actually a lot of psychological evidence has been able to prove that a gossip session um, actually, and I think we know this, right, brings... Um, brings some sense of bonding between the two people. So anyways, we have we have this scenario and then and then you know there's more more ideas of of the shallowness of the culture. You know, you have this husband who's right here is hitting on, you know, the we'll say young attractive woman and his wife is standing there right behind him and um and is watching him essentially try to cheat on his wife. And it's a good, there's a great depiction here. When we talk about tools, when we talk about this idea that I spoke about in the last lecture of, okay, everything that we see is something like self-interest. This is a perfect representation of it because there's the husband here. Look at how he sees, look at how they depict the new woman, right? The woman that he potentially has an, a chance to have an affair with versus the wife, right? This wife is seen as almost almost manly, right? She's seen as completely non-sexual, right? She has no appeal to her. She has no use for her, right? If we're going to talk in the tool analogy. And then for for the woman, obviously she's painted as obviously large breasts and also, you know, a beautiful face. And, um, and well, you know, if we're, if we're getting back to the idea of of the beast, you know, like it, it, he sees it, he sees the world in the same way that this man sees the world as he doesn't, he doesn't like the, the old woman, but at the same time, when she turns into a beautiful lady, he sees the value in her. So essentially every single thing that he's doing and every single thing that society does, and this is Bell's diagnosis is based off self-interest, based off the value that potentially either of the two women bring. Um, and then, yes, we run into this problem of conformity, right? And obviously this is something that, that we're going to be seeing um, throughout the entire movie. You know, she depicts, she depicts as a reader, right? She depicts the, um, the people around her as sheep who want to, who don't care about her book, you know? And the woman in this case, you know, um, one, two, three, like these girls here really, you know, just judge her and they're your traditional women, you know, they're your tra traditional conformist women is, is a good way of looking at it. You could see them as exactly the same character as the evil stepsisters in, in Cinderella, right? It's the same exact idea. They just judge the girl because she's different. And then you have the teacher and the students, therefore, who judge the students because they're different, you know? So now we essentially have a society that is completely under one established order, right? They're under one order of, you know, first of all, judgment, right? Like, they judge Belle because she's different. And the entire song is is designed around that, right? Like, Belle is... The entire message of the song is, Belle is weird and and peculiar. 
she's beautiful but peculiar, something like that. And everybody is going to make fun of her for that. So, um, well, that's the fight that we're, that we're, that we're starting to realize, you know, the fight that we're going to get into, and this is the fight that Belle's going to get into is saying, Hey, listen, I'm going to be, I'm going to have to fight against conformity. I'm going to have to fight against this. Well, if we're going to look at, at the idea of conformity, the idea of conformity, Conformity is the rejection of individuality. They're essentially the same thing. By conforming into this culture, you lose your sense of self because you are adopting the social constraints instead of your view of the world. And um, and this is the fight that Belle is going to go into. She's going to have the fight between do I want to be an individual or do I want to be part of a social system? And this is an idea that I explored really deeply in the in the, um, in the Dark Knight lecture series, where, well, it's really seen as a fight for yourself. It's really seen as a fight for your own individuality in a world where people have lost their own individuality. You know, and and that's a scary idea. Right, that's a scary idea. So the so the world that Bell is depicted in at the moment is a world full of order. Right, everybody is ran by this clock. Everybody follows the social rules. Everybody says bonjour. You know, um, everybody everybody acts as sort of like a sheep. Right, and by acting like a sheep, you are you are following the social order. But at the same time, everybody has no individuality, and therefore everybody is shallow. You know, everybody has these shallow interactions and they don't have any deep, we'll say, relationship with themselves or with the other people in society. And that's the thing that Belle is going to try to, um, she's going to try to go against. And, and all of these ideas, all of these ideas are conceptualized in the figure of Gaston, right? The figure of Gaston is saying, you know, he only cares about himself. He only cares about how beautiful Belle is, right? He doesn't care about how much she reads. And at the same time, um, that's, that's pretty much it. And he's, oh yes, and he's the perfect man for the conformist woman, right? You know, you think about him as the man who has ascended to the top of the diamond the dominance hierarchy roughly speaking you know obviously he's muscular and and he's an alpha male and, and all of these things but at the same time he is still part of the system he is still part of this conformist ordinary system that bell wants to get out of and um and there was a great quote that i that i heard a while ago that really relates to this it was um it was in a book it was how to how to get ideas. The book was called How to Get Ideas. And the quote was, the problem with the rat race is that at the end of the day, you're still a rat. And that's perfect, right? That's perfect. It's like, you know, whenever you decide to stay in the shallow, ordinary reality, it doesn't matter how much you ascend within this reality, no matter what, you're still going to be stuck in this poor, shallow reality. And well, you know, the we we could relate that to the idea of well money right because the problem the problem with money that we've diagnosed as a culture but still don't really know how to fight against is that you know we'll say there's the there's the thing that you want to do with your life in sort of your career you know and um and there's the thing that society wants you to do because it makes the most money you know i'm i'm dealing with that right now where, you know, there's, there's the societal pressures to be a, we'll say accountant, lawyer, doctor, finance person on wall street, you know, like those are the ones that make all the money. And those are the ones that, you know, we look, we look upon, we look up upon as a society. We say, those are the people who should be respectable. And then you have the potential to, we'll say, follow your dreams, which I think everybody has their own individual idea of that. And um, unfortunately, unfortunately, either it's too risky or it doesn't make enough money, right? Like th those are the characteristics that, that it really falls in. Unfortunately, you know, you have the, you have the person who wants to start a nonprofit and change the world. You have the person that wants to, you know, um, 
join the Peace Corps and and um, and help the people who are who are suffering. You know, you the people who actually want to fulfill some deeper fundamental desire as opposed to just pursuing money and and um, and social status. Yet, the problem is that those things are not societally accepted. We'll say from an individual level, you know, like that's the type of thing that your parents will look upon and say, really, really? Like, don't you just want to be a doctor? Don't you just want to be an accountant? You know? So, um, so this is the idea. This is the idea that, that it plays upon. It says, even if you are the most successful person, right? Cause Belle has the option to get Gaston. She is the, she is the option. They are giving her the option to ascend to the top of this ordinary reality. Right? They're saying you could get the best guy out of all of the guys in this town. Which is which is akin to you could have all the money in the world. You could achieve the impossible in the current hierarchies that are established by the culture. But you still won't be happy. Because no matter what, at the end of the day, once you decide to get into that shitty rat race you are still a rat at the end of the day you might be the best rat but you're still a rat and um and that's why she chooses to reject gaston right she chooses to reject gaston because she says i don't want to be a rat i want to i want to move out of the shallow world in which i have been raised in the shallow world in which the culture tells me to be in and i'm going to ascend beyond that and that well is very very closely related to the idea of when you wish upon a star, right? Now, let's look at Belle a little bit more. So she says, uh, um, that's exactly what she means, right? When she says, there must be more than this provincial life. She wants to get out of this ordinary reality, the or, the reality, that she, the culture that she has been placed in. And um, and it's very, it's very strongly represented here, you know? So you have the town in the background, and, um, and she, she decides to run outside the town to go to this more you know, we'll say spiritual place, you know, she gets to watch the sunset and, um, and think because one, one of, one of the ideas that's, that's portrayed in this, in this movie is that other people don't have, don't really think, you know, like if you're a sheep, you're not thinking, you're, you're just following. So, um, so she has this time to think and what ends up happening is, um, Well, she realizes that he, that she's the savior. I think this is the perfect way of looking at it. Well, this is something that Carl Jung really offers, and Jordan Peterson really talks about. And it's just it's just such a strong idea, you know. It says that the redeemer of civilization, the redeemer of a culture gone bad, is the individual. You know, like, like you have the power to go and to go and redeem because the unfortunate reality is, you know, in our society and in every society, we are surrounded by sheep. We are surrounded by sheep and the only thing wrong with that, actually, no, one of the things wrong with that is that when there's something wrong with the culture, the sheep won't point it out. So the question is, who is the one to point it out? Who is the one that's meant to save a dead culture? Or who's the one who's meant to save, we'll say, a culture that needs to be updated? Because our culture always is updating, is always changing. And the answer is the individual. You need to give the individual the chance to to make a change. And that's something that we see in our business environment, you know? Like, with an entrepreneur... We, as a culture, support entrepreneurs because the thing about entrepreneurs is they are the ones who are going to push society forward. We have someone like Bill Gates, someone like Steve Jobs, like all of these incredible people who are able to make the leap forward. However, something like, well, Bill Gates is one in a million, right? Steve Jobs is one of one in a million, something like 90% of entrepreneurs fail within the first 10 years. And that's, that's the idea. You know, we need to give people the opportunity to look at the culture from a new perspective and say, I want to change this. But at the same time, 
we want to only put in the good ideas. So Bell is going to be the individual, like an entrepreneur, but not completely because this is only about culture, who looks at this dead culture, who looks at this culture and says, wait a second, I could be the one to make a change. I could be the one who looks outside of this order, order, orderly, shallow place and, um, and wants to make a difference, right? And wants to, we'll say, redeem the culture. And, um, and that's why she gets out of the rat race, right? That's why she gets out of the rat race. And, you know, so that's what happens, right? This is, this is Gaston in the, in the new version. And, you know, they, they spend this, they spend a lot of time trying to develop the idea that Gaston is very similar to the the person that the prince was, right? So here he's a little narcissistic, right? Looking into the mirror, um, sort of like admiring himself. And then you have this idea over, where is it? Over here, right? Where, where the prince is also doing exactly the same thing. And, um, well, that's something that, that, that will be important later. But he, you know, this Gaston tries to hit on Bell and, well, here's the thing, you know, I, I think, I think we, I think we don't realize as a, as movie watchers, you know, as people who watch Disney movies and sort of, I guess, reach for the stars, that, that, that idea, you know, wish upon a star, we don't realize the actual reality of this, of someone like Gaston, you know, Gaston actually gives Belle a pretty good offer, like, Let's not lie to ourselves here. He offers her to be the richest woman in the in the city. He offers her security. He offers her protection, right? Protection from, in this case, right, other males and um, and and dangers and threats, right? And he offers her a good life, right? A good, well, a good life in terms of the material sense, and you can't really. I've spent a lot of time trying to trying to diffuse why people shouldn't make that decision, right? Why people in my business school, for example, why people decide to choose accounting and finance just day after day, you know? The people who are willing to essentially trade their happiness for money and um, for security, for essentially everything that, that Gaston is offering and... Um, and it's really, it would be very naive to, to say that it's not a good option. It would be very naive to say that people should just follow their hearts, that people should just take risks and, and go crazy and, and, and be bell. Because the unfortunate reality here, the unfortunate reality in life is that Gaston's given a pretty good offer. You know, Gaston is given a pretty good offer, but... Um, But Belle chooses. She says, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go beyond that." And I think, I think, well, this is an idea that I explored really deeply in the Dark Knight. I think that most people, by the time that you get to, we'll say like thirty, right? By the time that they get to thirty-five, have failed, right? Just like the entrepreneur. Well, actually, well, that's a perfect example. Just like the entrepreneur, we'll say ninety percent of the people who tried to go outside of the system have failed but it's damn worth trying but it's damn worth trying and i think that's that's the i think that's the idea that that's that's really put forth here it's like you know well did you know that t the the let me see if i could get this idea right so the The age in which most people run their first marathon. Yes. The age in which people run their first marathon takes a huge spike at the age of 29. So you would imagine that, you know, some people run their first marathon at 25, then 26, then 27, then 28. But for whatever reason, at the age of 29, there's a huge jump in the number of people that run their first marathon. And 
well, you got to ask the question, what does that mean and, and why, you know? And to me, and to, um, I read this in the book When by, um, by Daniel H. Pink, and the, um, the, the reasoning that he puts forth, and it seems to me to be self-evident that by the time that you hit 29, you realize that you're about to turn 30. And when you realize that you're about to turn 30, you look at it and say, wait a second, I'm about to turn 30 and I'm not the person that I thought I was going to be when I was 30, you know? Maybe, maybe I, you know, slacked off too much or maybe I never developed um, the business that I wanted to start or maybe I, ne you know, I didn't achieve the goals that I want to achieve, roughly speaking. And, and then what do you do? You say, okay, I'm going to take that control back. I'm going to take that control back. I'm going to do something that is magnificent. And, um, and to prove to myself that I'm still an individual, that I haven't just given in to whatever mechanism that has been trying to take me, whether, whether it be laziness, whether it be uh, conformism, whether it be culture, whether it be whatever, I am going to try to redeem my individuality by doing some crazy goal like a marathon. And um, and that's why people run. That's why there's a huge spike at the age of 29. And well, the problem with that, the, the unfortunate problem with that is that most people lose their, or most people lose their individuality by the time they're, they're 30. That's, that's, or many people lose their individuality by the time that they're 30, and that's a rough thing, right? That's a rough thing, and that's the, that's the basis for a midlife crisis, you know? And I think, I think it's important to look at the reason behind that. I think it really is, and, and here's the... Well, here's the reason. Here's the reason. This answer you will find in the idea of Beauty and the Beast. So right now we meet her father, and the thing about her father is... He's good. He's he's a good guy, right? He's a good guy, but he's an idealist, right? He's the he's the inventor. He's the he's also the chaos within the system, right? He's an inventor. He's a creative guy within a non-creative system, and well, that's a good thing because he teaches her something like you shouldn't be satisfied with the reality in which you are in, but it's also a problem because it's somewhat sheltering. It somewhat leaves her as naive because at this point she hasn't faced the harsh reality of the world. You know, the reason why she turns down De Gaston partially, right, in part, is because she has no idea what's coming for her. She has no idea what happens when you go on a hero's journey. What happens when you decide, well, in her case, a heroine's journey. What happens when you go, to, go outside your ordinary reality it's not an easy task. That's why 90% of people fail. And um, so the problem with Belle and the problem with every child hero, the problem with every child heroine, whatever it is, every single idealist is that they're naive, right? The problem with the idea of when you wish upon a star is that it's a naive idea, you know? It doesn't say when you wish upon a star and you also have your, your financial secured. You know, it's, it's just when you wish upon a star and um, something like you'll figure it out. But, well, the problem is, yes, you end up, you end up as naive. And, well, this is something that we all really struggle with. You know, this, this is like the, the middle schooler, high schooler problem and also college. I'll, I'll actually say college because, um, because this is the point where, where you really face the real world and you and you actually start to reject it because you're like, wait a second, this real world is is a lot harder than I thought, you know? Like in middle school, high school, and we'll say maybe the beginning of college, you're sitting there like, yes, yes, I could conquer the world. I could do everything that I want to do, you know? Like name your goal, name your dream job. I am going to do it. Um, and then the real world hits and you say, wait a second, maybe I can't. Maybe I can't. Or maybe... Maybe I want to do it, but I just can't motivate myself to do it. You know, that's one of the biggest problems that I had when I really wanted to start up my own company. I, um, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I had this good idea to start up a company, and, um, and I just couldn't motivate myself to do it. I just couldn't. 
Like there, it was an idea that was brewing in my head. I was constantly coming with coming up with ideas, but I couldn't take the steps to you know. Well, for in my case, I wanted to start up a a um, an education business, and I had to actually start up the education business. Like I had to start coding and start building the online platform and start doing all of these things, and I just I just didn't do it. I just didn't do it because I ran into this unfortunate problem of okay, great kid, Nick, you got an idea? That's that's wonderful. Actually implement it. Actually see what happens when you when you have to put in the eighty hour weeks to go and to go and do it. You know, it's it's not as easy as it looks. And um and it crushed me. I never started up the business. And the thing that I realized, therefore, was I was naive. Right? When I tried to do this, I was incredibly naive and when I when reality hit me, I was crushed. And I was part of the ninety percent of people who failed. And this is in the Bell's Bell's experiencing. So in terms of in terms of innocence, right? In terms of naivety, it's symbolized in this idea of the white rose. So what happens is she asks her father for a rose uh for a white rose every single year. And um and you could just look, you could just look at, you know, this picture right here. You know, she just looks like a child. She looks like somebody who is um who is somewhat naive, and that's exactly what they were going for. You know, he asks, she asked him for a white, white obviously meaning purity, innocence, and um, he asks, she asked for it every single year from her father, right? And that's really important. The idea that her father is the one, her parent is the one giving her the, um, we'll say, innocence, giving her the sheltering is. Um, well, it means that she's still a kid. She's still naive. She's still, um, we'll say, that's a good way of looking at it. You know, we've been symbolizing the rose as as a symbol for life. You know, the fact that she's asking for a white rose and not the actual rose, right? The red rose, is because she only has a partial depiction of life. She only has a partial depiction of what a rose is, and that's a white rose. She doesn't have the depiction of the full rose, which is a red rose. So um, so this is the problem in which she struggles with. So what happens is she goes and her father goes to fetch the rose because her father wants to, we'll say, maintain her innocence and also maintain her dependence upon him, which is a which is a deeper idea and it's a, it's a little bit more difficult to explain but I'll, we'll see we'll see if I want to explain it so um so yes so yes exactly what she's he's doing here is he's getting her the white rose and what happens is the beast comes along so he realizes that the beast he's in the beast's castle and um and the beast comes and imprisons him and um Okay, I'm going to explain it. I'm going to explain it. So this is... This is a very Jungian idea, and this is an idea in which I've been trying to grapple with, trying to understand. And Well, it's not an idea that's, that's very popular, but... At, well, when I say popular, I mean it's somewhat taboo, but, but at the same time, I think it's something that needs to be explored because this is what the Beauty and the Beast is really trying to tell you. And well, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, it's a little bit weird. So the first thing that we got to figure out is, um, it's a question that we must figure out and it's perfectly summed up in this idea, you know, like his father's got his hands on her chin and she's got her, she's got her hands on his leg. And it's an idea that we haven't really explored in, in our society. But the, the question is, why is it that opposite sex parent-child relationships are so much stronger. You know, why is it that a daughter and a and a father have a special bond? And why is it that a mother and a son have a special bond? And what does that have to do with the sexual relations between parents and children or the sexual feelings between parents and children? And well it's a not not an easy idea to talk about because, you know, obviously there's a this is an idea that we know of, right? It's an idea that we know of. Like the idea of um, 
Barney Stinson and How I Met Your Mother always talks about the idea of daddy issues, right? And and I think we know that the idea of daddy issues exists, you know, and that's that's the idea of a girl who has a poor relationship with her father and therefore seeks out men, seeks out sexual relationships with people who resemble her father, right? The cold, distant, emotion, uh, emotionless people. And then... Um, and then there's also this idea in society, which we, we sort of understand, right? Like we know that for whatever reason, if you have a positive relationship, no, no, not if you have a positive relationship, almost no matter what you, um, you, the person in which you end up with. So, you know, the person that you get married to, the person that you start dating strongly resembles your opposite sex parent. If you're in a heterosexual couple and what does that mean, right? What does that mean? And why does this exist? And why does this happen? And um, so the explanation that seems to be in order here actually plays out throughout, throughout the Beauty and the Beast. And I will just try to sort of narrate as it goes on because Beauty and the Beast explains it perfectly, right? This is why it's an archetypal story. And, you know, one thing, one note about stories is that this is an uncomfortable topic, and I think the reason, one of the reasons why we have stories like this is because this story explains an uncomfortable topic without making it uncomfortable, right? Since it does it in such highly encoded images, it's like, you know, we could just sort of gloss over it by also understanding it at the same time. So I think, I think that the... The Beauty and the Beast does a really good job at this. But anyways, so we have, what happens is, right? So right now we have essentially an over-reliance of, okay, so Jung, Jung would say that when we are born or sometime throughout uh, our psychological development, Freud said it's around six years old, um, but Jung says that sometime along our psychological development, we develop some sort of need for, um, for the opposite sex, and this is this is this is assuming that um, just we're we're gonna go with a heterosexual example, just so that we don't have any complications, um, just to simplify it, and um, so sometime along our along our development, we have this sort of need that um for the opposite sex, and you know, God, it's like, isn't that self evident, and um. And Jung says that as we've sort of prolonged our, you know, prolonged our, the time it takes for us to get married and the time it takes for us to um, develop sexual relations with the other sex, right? Like, you know, it used to be, we used to have children at 13 years old. Now it's something like between 18 and 30. So during that transition period, and maybe a little bit before, we... um we we start to find the solace for that need in our opposite sex parent and this goes for obviously um sons and daughters and um and that's exactly what this is representative here and this is why the father is the one who gets her the white rose the father is the one who's delivering her something that's somewhat romantic right but at the same time has a sense of innocence to it you know it's it's not the full romance it's not the full thing but what ends up happening somewhere along our development is that we lose our reliance on our parent. That fundamental need that we have for for the opposite sex, right? For, yes, just for the opposite sex, is challenged because at some point we want to obviously develop a romantic relationship with the people of our age. And this is exactly what, what this movie is representing. So therefore, we have the father who is going to get the white rose for the... For the um, for her daughter, and the beast is the one who locks her up, right? The beast is the one who takes the father and says, wait a second, I am going to replace you. And um, and this is when he locks up the father. And I think, I think this idea is really, it's latent throughout our culture, you know? It's, it's really a strong idea in our culture. You know, there's the trend, there's the stereotypical awkward moment of, um, of when the 
when the son, when the boyfriend is sitting with the father uh, on prom night and is waiting for the girl to walk down the stairs. You know, you know the idea. And then the girl walks down the stairs, and both the father and the um, and the boyfriend stand up at the same time to to say how beautiful the girl looks. And there's sort of like this fight. You know, it's the transition period. Another one that's that's really really like this is the the best one that I've seen within our culture is the idea of of marriage, right? Who walks the daughter, who walks the, the girl down the aisle? It's the father. And what does the father do? The father takes the girl's hands and transfers it over to the husband. And that's sort of the idea. You know, if you don't, obviously you could see that in sort of like a possession type of way, but if we're, if we're just going to look at it in, in a archetypal type of way, you know, in the, in the transition of the girl's needs, exactly how we've been looking at it before, we'll say that it's just simply the exactly what Beauty and the Beast is showing right here. It's the transition of the fundamental need of the opposite sex from the father to the, um, to the boyfriend and, or husband or whatever. And, um, and it's not an easy idea. It's not an easy idea, right? It's, it's not an easy transition either. So, so that's where that lies. And, um, and then what ends up happening is Belle comes in, right? And Belle must come and rescue her father. That's the next part of the archetype, right? Belle, who's over-relying on her father. Belle, who is, um, who relies on her father for, we'll say, for the, for the fulfillment of that need. Um, goes to rescue her father, right? And goes to rescue her father. And now she's left with the choice, right? Now she's left with the fundamental choice. And this is the this is the beginning of the heroine's journey in this specific case, right? And this is um this is what she does. What does she do? She decides to voluntarily sacrifice herself for her father. She decides to voluntarily switch places. And I'm sure you could see exactly what that means, right? She's saying, okay, now I am finally going to get rid of this idea of my father. I'm going to get rid of this need. I'm going to go into my own prison, right? And the idea of going into your own prison is, um, we'll say, the absolution absolution absol absolution of naivety right she decides i'm going to go to extend outside of the ordinary reality i'm going to be different i'm going to be an individual so what does she do she ventures out into the unknown she finds the non-ordinary reality which is the beast right which is the werewolf essentially and um and what is the first thing that she does she gets locked up she gets locked up in a prison and that's the exact idea. And that's the exact idea that I was talking about with um, with the beast, right? With the prince who turns into the beast. The beast realizes that he is in a, you know, he starts off as a naive child. He starts off as a Peter Pan character. Then what happens? He turns into a beast. And what does the beast mean? The beast means he's transcended ordinary reality and he's realized that he's not ready for it. He realizes that he is inadequate and... Um, and that's exactly what Belle does. So Belle decides to transcend this normal reality. She decides to get out of the shallow world in which she lives in. And the first thing that she does when she confronts the beast is that she ends up in prison. And, well, that's the same representation. That's the same exact idea. And, um, and she sacrifices herself for her father. And what is she doing in that moment? She's sacrificing herself her father, her relationship with her father. She's sacrificing her, um, her dependence on her father for a, uh, potential relationship with the beast for a potential relationship with somebody in which she could have a romantic relationship with. And, um, it's a very complex idea, but it's, a. it makes sense. You know, it, it makes sense. It's something that, um, that we're all going to experience sometime throughout our lives, you know, and, and well, it just this this is the thing that explains it perfectly, and this explains the first of all the rough transition period, and this is it also explains why people getting back to the the um, the actual idea of why people have daddy issues, right? Why why women have you know this, and why women and men both marry people that are similar to their parents. It's because their dependence, right? That we could say that marrying someone who's similar to your 
um, father and mother, right? Opposite sex parent, or something like daddy issues is something that is a problem, right? It's a problem. Like it shouldn't happen. And, um, and it seems like the reason is very, very simple. Now that, now that we understand this idea, the reason is very, very simple. At one point, you had your dependent upon you had your dependence of the opposite sex on your opposite sex parent, but you never got over that. You were never able to break apart. You never, in this case, voluntarily sacrificed your parent for yourself and went out on a limb, and um, and therefore you are stuck in a stage of psychosexual development where you are constantly looking for people that resemble your opposite sex parent and um well to me that seems obvious to me that seems obvious daddy issues is, is such a simple idea it's like okay you know you you were unable to develop past the idea that you're um past the idea of we'll say i should be treated like We'll say, we'll say just, I should be treated poorly, or I should go for the guys that are very similar to, you know, my father who is very, we'll say, emotionally detached and has probably some sort of suppression issues. I'm going to go for those guys. Why? It's because your dependence upon, upon the opposite sex relies on the relationship with your parents, and you were never able to break away. You were never able to... Um, to transcend this barrier. And in this case, the barrier is to take a risk, take a step, just like Bell does, and to personally imprison yourself. And go out on a limb, right? To go out on a limb to say, I'm gonna develop, I'm gonna see what I like instead of just relying on whatever um whatever my previous relationship was with my parent. So um so that's a deep idea. If you have any questions, I think I think um, if you're watching this on YouTube, then ask them in the comments because I think this is a really really complex idea, and I think I explained it pretty well, not not incredibly well, not perfectly well. So um, so yeah, definitely go ask questions, and that is the end of lecture three for Beauty and the Beast.